Hi everyone. Sure. This hi everyone. Uh, this is Asim from Give Asia, uh, and this is our Meet the Giver series. Today, I'm delighted uh, to be having this conversation with uh, Yong Techmeg, who uh, heads up uh, Habitat for Humanity Singapore in the capacity of national director. Um, Techmeg, welcome to this show. Uh, how how are you doing? Hi. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Techmeg, I would like to start with uh, understanding a little bit more about what was your journey in terms of getting involved with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, when, when did you first uh, come across Habitat for Humanity and how did you start? Okay, uh, I, I think that uh, we are linked together by our mutual friend, right, Usha Menon. So really, Usha is uh, one of the key reasons why I am the person who heads up Habitat for Humanity. So what happened was that uh, ever since I left university, I've always wanted to be involved in some kind of a voluntary work. So as I work, I always uh, uh, sort of quickly get involved in all, all sorts. And uh, at that time, Usha Menon was an expat wife. You can't imagine, but uh, that was many, many years ago. So the National Council of Social Service started out a new Back then it was new, called the ComChess. So they had this idea that they will invite professionals to come and go around trying to raise money for the ComChess. And so uh, my company, uh, a, a company called Digital Equipment, it, it, it is now gone really. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, then they open it up to the employees and say, you know, who wants to go and volunteer? So the idea is that the company will second a professional to community chess for 30 working days. And then, you know, community chess can use them to do whatever. And so I went, I volunteered and I went. The first day I met Usha, Usha was there as a, she was a housewife. And, and so she volunteered to do the same thing. And that's how we got to know each other. And then Usha stayed on with ComChess for a long time and she keep climbing up the ranks. As you know, she's a very passionate and very effective kind of a, a manager. And so same with me, I continue to do my volunteer work with them. And, uh, and after a while, I went to do other voluntary work. And all of a sudden, one fine day, I received a call from Usha Menon uh, because she got poached by Habitat International to work for them as a director of uh, international fundraising. And so she said that, you know, they are thinking of starting a Habitat Singapore. Would I be interested to help them do this? And uh, so I asked her, you know, what does that really mean? She said, you just have to make it happen. So, <laughs> so I thought, well, that, that's exactly what I want to hear. And of course, uh, I did a bit of research as to what Habitat is all about. I felt that their kind of uh, work is very important. It's a Christian charity that help people regardless of race, language, or religion. And so I, I like that commonality. And so I then volunteered to help her. Uh, help the international office start the Singapore branch. And that was in the year 2004, I believe, yeah. So since then, I, I, I was the first chairman and uh, as a volunteer, continued to set up the office and help them run the place. And we have a, a national director as well. And what happened was that then the first big development came with the Asian tsunami. And with the Asian tsunami, the projects became very big. We had to build many houses in Aceh, Indonesia, and it was not possible to just run it as a volunteer anymore. And so I decided then to become a full-time national director. That's great. And Habitat for Humanity is one of the largest charities in the world. Could you share with us the impact as well as the vision and the mission of the organization? Well, Habitat for Humanity is focused on one thing, and that's shelter. We believe that uh, in a fight against poverty, having a proper roof over your head is the most fundamental first step. Because if you don't have a proper place to live in, you don't have dignity, and you are not able to then take care of your family, your kids get sick, they don't get to go to school. And in some places in the world, like uh, India and uh, some parts of Africa, when you don't have a proper house, it's actually very dangerous for the people who who are in that shed. So women, for example, will get assaulted. And so a proper secure house, we believe to be the most important uh, aspect of poverty fighting. And with a proper house then, people can get their act together, they can then uh, take care of their family. So we are pretty catalytic in nature. We believe that whatever we do, 
we want it to become something which the person who is a beneficiary will then help himself. So our strategy is to focus very much on the working poor, uh, folks who are already working but are not able to help themselves because, you know, for whatever circumstances, so that they then in turn can help their neighbours and help the whole village. Uh, and we serve people regardless of their race, language or religion. We want to focus on this idea that uh, everybody can agree on a common good. I mean, we can disagree about religion or sexual orientation or whatever it is, but we can all agree that we want to do good. And this is the part that attracts me to Habitat's work. So uh, it's a very simple concept. Uh, you walk into a room full of people and then you ask them, you know, there's this guy out there who needs help. Uh, who wants to come and join me to do something about it? And you raise your hand, we don't care whether you are Christian, Muslim, Indian, uh, Hindu, gay, lesbian, whatever, it doesn't matter. We are all focused on a community of wanting to help the people. And so uh, then we all go out there, we build the house. And uh, generally speaking, we want the house partner to co-build with us. And after the house is finished, uh, if possible, the person should pay back the cost of the house in a not-for-profit manner. Uh, and, and that one depends on the country you go to and the financial situation of the house recipient. Personally, I had the fortune to be a volunteer at one of the Habitat Bills. Uh, this was in the uh, US in yeah. South San Francisco. And uh, a friend of oh, mine uh, signed us up for a weekend uh, volunteer trip. And as we were yeah. building the house alongside uh, people who are going to be living in that house, it was an uh, absolutely yes, phenomenal yes, yes. feeling uh, to see that you're uh, working yes. with a fellow human being. And, uh, you know, in, in a small way, it's going to transform their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, you yes. just feel that uh, authentic connection because every one of us can relate with uh, the necessity of having a roof uh, over your head. So, so I'm definitely a big supporter exactly. of Habitat. Well, we, we always say that there are two groups of beneficiaries in our work. Number one, of course, the person who is receiving the house. Second will be the volunteers. I mean, look at you. You are phenomenal in the work that you do as well. We pray that that will be the case for all volunteers. So you come, you suddenly realize that, hey, man, how, life is not just about, you know, having a fast car or big house or whatever it is. And if after you finish a Habitat Build, you decide to go and do something else to, I don't know, save the cockroach or whatever, <laughs> so long as it's good, uh, we are all happy. We think that that's a very good way to have touch uh, other people's life. And this is one of the reasons why Habitat is popular around the world as well. When people get participate in House Build, they feel that their, their spirit is lifted and they get to think a little bit deeper about life. And then they go back and they tell their friends about it and, you know, so therefore, by word of mouth, Habitat's work uh, get to spread very quickly and uh, very popular around the world. Yeah. I'm very happy to be involved in this work. Oh, cool. There you go. <laughs> well, you look like a Bollywood star. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. South San Francisco. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, so I totally agree with you uh, that uh, it, it is an amazing uh, feeling to be a volunteer. And in fact, I use that slide uh, whenever I talk about the journey of starting Asia because it was one of those moments when I yeah. uh, realized uh, how meaningful it can be to work with your friends. Uh, to help a fellow human being. And yeah, yeah. that was the feeling that uh, we were trying to recreate with the platform Give Asia. And uh, we have also seen uh, right. Habitat for Humanity has been actively using uh, your GiveWiki, so habitat.give.asia. Uh, and uh, recently it has been yeah. receiving quite a lot of uh, support from donors and fundraisers. Uh, would you like to share a little bit about your experience using Asia and using online uh, tools for fundraising? I need you to repeat your, your question. You're breaking up a little bit. Sure. Uh, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your experience using online fundraising tools uh, ah, like okay. Asia. So I, we are very appreciative. Okay. 
we are very appreciative of, of Give Asia and, and the platform because as you know, there are many, many platforms uh, out there. Some are scams, right? So to be able to have a platform that is reputable, uh, that's easy to refer to and easy to use is ex extremely important to us because the alternative is to then spend uh, resources and manpower to go maintain your own uh, kind of a thing, which is really not very useful that way. So for that, we are very appreciative. We, we have found the, the use of the platform to be uh, very easy. I think one of the things that may be underestimated is the trust factor, meaning the public trust the platform. And I think that's extremely important. And so people don't think about it. They, they, they know that when it is up there, it is good. In fact, somebody just wrote me something. Uh, I can't remember what's the organization, but it was using your platform. And so he asked me, is this digit? And I say, hey man, if it's on TIFF, then it's digit, no problem, you know. So I think that's a very valuable thing that you guys are contributing. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Techman. Uh, and uh, can you share a little bit about how important is uh, doing these volunteer builds as a group and also raising funds as a group? Because I see a lot of your fundraising is actually done through uh, build projects. So a lot of uh, these youth build projects. Yeah. Right. Uh, for us, the, the, the whole idea is really to eliminate poverty housing around the world. So the build actually is a very important aspect of what we do. Of, although this is really a task that cannot be fulfilled, certainly within my lifetime or maybe even the next few generation but you know as as in the area of poverty fighting it is a kind of an endless uh, goal that we, we we keep going forward to us to be able to build means that we are as i mentioned earlier inspiring a new group of people and the youth especially are important the founder of habitat for humanity is a person by the name of miller fuller miller fuller pointed out that getting young people engaged in habitat work is one of the key reasons why Habitat grew globally. Because young people from high school, middle school, or even university students, they will grow up to be CEOs and be movers and shakers of society like, like you are, you know. And so being able to inspire them uh, is extremely important for the future. So we are especially uh, focused on wanting to get young people involved important as well because you know without contribution from the donors and all that they, you're not going to be able to do anything so we always believe that uh, the word we use is the build is the magic if we are able to get people to go and experience the build itself exactly as you have experienced we think that the chances of us getting their support will be much higher so that's why everywhere we go we try to introduce some kind of build the closest place we build of course is Batam uh, and we are sending volunteers everywhere from Cambodia to Philippines. But because of the COVID right now, everything, of course, has gone into a sudden halt. You know? But uh, in a normal situation, the build is a, a very important part of our DNA. So much so that for me and my office, uh, I require that my staff every single year participate in one build themselves, somewhere outside of Singapore. And also as a group, the entire office will go and build a house uh, somewhere in the region. And we do that so as to continue to remind ourselves as the importance of building. Yeah. Well, that's amazing to hear that it's part of your culture to experience that year after year. Uh, that's, that's phenomenal. Uh, could you share yeah. about your local programs in Singapore? What are the needs and what are the ways in which you are uh, gapping uh, or bridging those gaps? Okay. Uh, of course, Singapore is the, few people know this, but Singapore is the only country in this entire planet that does not have poverty housing. Uh, meaning in this country, you don't have a slum or a place that's a terrible housing condition. And that's because, you know, it's a small country and you have a very highly efficient government. I half suspect that every single tree in Singapore has a serial number somewhere. <laughs> they, they know everything, you know, they are able to control all that. So there's nothing to build in Singapore. It's not possible. Uh, we stumbled upon the fact that there are a lot of elderly poor who live in a terrible housing condition uh, many years ago. Uh, what happened was that, I, I believe it was in the year 2005, 
So I was visiting a friend who runs a senior activity center in Red Hill. So these are one-room flats, and he's at the bottom uh, running a karaoke or some exercising for the elderly. And so I asked him to bring me around to take a look at the place uh, where he was residing, and he brought me to a, a one-room flat. And, and as we opened the door, as I entered the door, a very strong stench of urine came by. There was an old lady who was paralyzed from the waist down, lying on the bed. Uh, sadly, she has no visitors or her daughter come and visit very irregularly and she cannot move. And so she, therefore, you know, she was on the bed and so unhappily, she, her natural functions was all done on the bed. And I also noticed that the whole place was crawling with bed bugs and it was just a very filthy, horrible uh, environment. And immediately I realized that we have stumbled upon a need that we need to address. Because while Habitat is about housing, it's about living condition. We do not believe that any person made in the image and likeness of God should be allowed to live like an animal in a slum. So it's the same thing. You don't have a slum, but and so a place is in a mess. And because of that, uh, what we call Project Homework was born. So we gather volunteers together, we go in, we clean the house uh, for her, make sure that she has a dignified way to live life. And so that's one of the key uh, projects that we do in Singapore. And so every, almost every weekend, we will gather people to go and clean the houses of these uh, elderly folks who are too weak or too sick to take care of themselves. And this is a highly uh, popular program. Even in the COVID uh, circuit breaker, I wanted to use the word short, short now, circuit breaker situation, uh, we are still serving. We got permission to be classified uh, as essential service for this to do house cleaning. Because if we don't, uh, the place really will become very uh, terrible and, and, and it may spread disease and, and, and become worse for the elderly. So this is a key program we are doing now. How can people support uh, Habitat for Humanity Singapore? At this point in time, of course, uh, like all charities, right, funding will become an issue. Once we stop building, it means that there are very little reason to raise money. So, for example, if I were to go to a corporation and say, hey, why don't your entire sales department go build a house in Batam? Uh, when you do that, would you consider giving us a donation to help us run the the organization. So that's one of the key ways we raise our money. So now that there's no build, there is really very little so-called excuse to, to, to get people to get involved in our work. So clearly, I know it's a very cliche thing to say, money is of course always important for a charity. So one key reason way is to, to, to give a donation online to your, your platform, for example. Uh, there are other things that we are thinking of. Right now, we have a new program called So Much Love. Uh, we are sewing quilt blankets to be sent to our beneficiaries in Papua, in uh, Cambodia, in, and even in Singapore for some of the elderly who, who, who may need a blanket. So uh, folks can actually donate a quilt square design. So for example, your kids at home nothing to do, right? So get them to design something a square and give us a donation of $20. We'll put it into a quilt blanket for you. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do iron transfer so your kids brilliant artwork will be transferred. So the whole idea is to be encouraging. So a quilt blanket will have 144, 114 squares of encouragement to whoever. So we think that is a wonderful way to reach out to people, even though you cannot participate in the field right now. Uh, that's great. We would love to host this campaign on Give Asia. So do let us know once uh, it's ready to go live. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. We are preparing it right now. Okay, yeah, great, get, get great. Folks. great. Uh, what is your message to donors, uh, to people who have uh, come forward and supported you through solidarity payments, but also through other ways? What will your message be for them? You know, when I am doing this kind of work, as I think you must feel the same, right? Uh, it always surprised me at how easy it is in a sense. I mean, it's not rocket science, right? It, it is basically putting our mind to a problem and solving it as they come. I'm, I, I'm very happy to be speaking to, to you because I know that you and I share something in common, right? We are people who are, we are idealists, so to speak, right? We, we want to make this world a better place. 
uh, but I'm sure you will agree with me that as much as the challenges are, can be serious, the solutions are not so complicated. It is a question of wanting to do something. And I know for certain that most people out there have so much that actually it doesn't take very much for them to give. You know, you, you talk about this, this whatever package that the government has given to them. I know that yes, there are people who are in trouble for sure. But at the same time, there are also people who have a lot. And that's the way the world is. So I would encourage people to really think about the possibilities of giving more than you think you want to. I mean, the, the government package order is great, but it's, it, it should be not just because government give you extra 600 bucks so you give it away. Would you not think about what your life is all about and, and share? Instead of thinking what's the latest iPhone number 12 or whatever, would you not think that, hey man, you know, by giving the money away to whatever cause that is close to your heart, you will make a difference in someone's life. And I'm very, very convinced that if the entire world thinks like that, you and I will be out of a job. We, we don't have to do all this anymore because the world will be a much better place, isn't it? But of course, at last, this is not the case. So if you are watching this, then I say, think a little bit more, which in reality is not that much more anyway. But by whatever it is that you are doing, know that someone out there somewhere will really be helped because of your little thought. So, so Techwing, we are similar in quite some ways because my journey kind of began by volunteering with Habitat. Your journey began with like volunteering while you were working with your company. Uh, if you could go back and yes. give some advice to your young self when you were just getting started into the social sector, what would that advice be? Oh, uh, I, I hope I'm not sounding a bit arrogant, <laughs> but I've thought about this since I was young. I'm kind of a weird kid, right? So for me, it was the most natural thing to think that uh, I started my career as an electrical engineer. It was most natural for me to think that, hey man, you know, I'm an engineer now, I, I got a job and all that. And but you're not married, I was not married back then as well. Why don't I just spend my weekend or whatever going to do something? Uh, and it, it always surprised me as to how easy it is that I, I, you, you really don't have to think until we're not asking people to, to, to invent a rocket science, a, a, a nuclear bomb or whatever. It is a, a simple decision to say that I'm going to help whoever to do something. Uh, and the need on the ground is also so big. Uh, so if I were to think back, right, uh, when I started my career, I, I was already active. If I were to go back, I think I want to spend a lot more time convincing other people to join the journey because I think that uh, we need a lot more people. Uh, as a lone contributor, of course, there's some impact, but it would be much better if at an earlier age, I'm able to convince a lot more of my peers to maybe join me in the journey. Because at this stage in my life, uh, I've been trying to tell my peers to do something, but it seems that they are pretty old and set in their ways. <laughs> They're all thinking about retirement. For example, the foreign worker situation right now, uh, just to let you know, this is something that Habitat will be actually working on after the dust has settled, right? Because we want to think carefully about how can we allow them to live in a horrible uh, living condition as well. But it's a very complicated issue. When I try to convince my peers now to do something, a lot of them were, were like, you know, hey man, we are old, we, we have grandchildren to play with, or whatever it is, and they, they don't want to do it anymore. So if I were to start again, I would probably want to rope in a lot more people so that it is not so much just a loan. Okay, uh, yeah, that's, that, sounds, that sounds good. Uh, last, last question, Techman. Uh, what is your last question? What is your message uh, to people to get through this COVID-19 crisis? Oh, uh, one, one of the old story I always remember, right? Uh, King Solomon is supposed to be the wisest man who has ever lived. So he was, he summoned all his court officials and asked them, you know, I want to give you a challenge. You got to 
come up with a phrase that will make the people who are glad sad and the people who are sad glad. You know, if you're happy, it should make you sad and if you're sad, it make you glad. And so these people went off to think for like three, four days and they came up to the king and said, we got the answer. The answer is, these two shall pass. So, so if you are glad, you're very happy and celebrating, you think these two shall pass, oh no, it's going to pass soon, so you will become sad. But if you are sad, like us being stuck in COVID-19, if you think about these two shall pass, then you will become glad because it will pass. Of course it will pass, these two shall pass. But I think hopefully this period of time will cause us to reflect a lot more on humanity. I am particular about the foreign worker situation because uh, as I was saying before Habitat, actually, I was quite involved in the foreign worker welfare uh, part until uh, well, uh, the living condition, the way we treat them, the way we, we deal with them, uh, the kind of disrespect we have to people of countries that are politically and militarily weak, you know, that's why they are here working for us. It's, it's just uh, terrible. And so uh, I think that that's one thing that we need to reflect upon. So we are now forced to reflect upon it because, you know, they are the one who, who is uh, having the highest numbers there. I, 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 I'm prayerful that this period of time will be a time for a kind of a social awakening for Singapore so that when we finish and emerge out of it, when these two shall pass, we, we hopefully we'll have a more compassionate Singapore and one in which we will try to live up to our status as a first world country in terms of GDP so that our emotions, our, our ethics, our, even our spiritual life will be elevated more. So maybe this is a good period of time for everybody who think a little bit deeper as to what your life is all about. And when all the, the the restrictions are lifted. Don't rush out there and buy your bubble tea immediately. Maybe you want to go out there and think about what you can do better with your life for the sake of other people. Uh, thank you so much, Dekmeng. This has been uh, really, really insightful and also very meaningful. I, I personally learned a lot of new things and uh, I'm thank really you. thankful for what you are doing with Habitat for Humanity and also your future plans, uh, which as you mentioned, uh, are going to be bigger and better and stronger. So thanks yeah, again yeah. Uh, for your time. And uh, we look forward to continue working with Habitat for Humanity Singapore and uh, working with you to increase your impact and increase your reach uh, more and more to, uh, in the following years to come. Thanks, thanks, Tech. I appreciate your support too. Thank you so much. This has thanks. been wonderful talking to you. Thank you.